Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering at the University of Calgary. And this is module three in my computer networks lecture series, which talks about the physical layer. So as I mentioned in the previous module, I'm actually going to use the protocol stack itself to define and guide the structure of these lectures. And in true engineering fashion, we're going to start at the very bottom and we're going to basically build the internet from the bottom up. And so what you can see on this slide is a series of devices or nodes all connected together over some common shared analog communication channel. And maybe this is a, a wire, maybe it's the wireless channel within a room. And basically every single device that is communicating in a network will be running its own copy of the protocol stack software. And so we talked about all the different layers at the end of module two. We have the physical layer, the data link layer, routing, transport session, and application layer. I've deliberately left the presentation layer out because it's not really used in most modern protocols. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to start right here at the bottom. We're starting at the physical layer. And the physical layer is basically the, or the design goal of the physical layer is basically to send a string of bits from the trans from a node we call the transmitter to another node we call the receiver over some kind of an analog channel. And this is the area of digital communications. And I'm not going to, it's a, it's a huge area. There's a whole class undergraduate class dedicated to it. I actually did my master's and my PhD specifically on physical layer communications. And so there's a ton of work here to do. But because we are mainly interested in protocol design in this particular lecture series, in this particular course, I'm going to talk a bit about the physical layer in this module, but we're not going to go into a ton of details. But just so we're, we're, we're somewhat grounded in at least the terminology, the term modulation refers to mapping digital bits into analog waveforms that are able to travel over an analog channel. And there are a whole variety of analog channels. This could be a twisted pair copper telephone wire. This could be the basically free space. So it could be the wireless channel. It could be a fiber optic cable. It could be the mud that is forced down through the pipes when you're drilling an oil and gas well. There are a huge number of channels. The waveforms that we construct to represent our digital information, we sometimes refer to as symbols. And the symbol duration, which we're going to denote TS, is basically the time between symbol transitions. So basically how long we hold a waveform constant before we switch to the next waveform to transmit another um, bit or another group of bits. And sometimes we have only two waveforms to choose from, in which case we're, we're dealing with what we call binary modulation. However, often and typically in most modern communication systems, we have more than two waveforms to choose from. So if in general we have capital KS different waveforms to choose from, then we can send log base 2KS bits per waveform or bits per symbol. And just to give you an example, I've got two modulation schemes here. At the bottom, we have what's known as binary phase shift keying or BPSK. This is where we transmit our ones and zeros using a sinusoidal waveform. This is often, this type of sinusoidal modulation is often used by wireless systems. And we transmit a one with a sinusoid that has a particular phase. And then when we want to transmit a zero, we basically invert the phase or we, we give the, we invert the waveform or we give it a phase of 180 degrees. And so, a phase of zero transmits a one, 
and a phase of 180 degrees transmits a zero. We only have two waveforms to choose from, so one waveform represents a one, the other waveform represents a zero. At the top of the slide, we have what we call a four airy modulation scheme. And when we say four airy, that means we have four waveforms to choose from. We could have an eight airy system, which, which would have eight waveforms to choose from. We can actually have symbol sizes or um, waveform sets all the way up to 256 different waveforms. But in this example, we have four. This is a pulse amplitude or PAM modulated system where we have a single square pulse and we transmit information using four different levels. Because we have four different levels to choose from, we can actually transmit two bits per waveform or two bits per symbol. Zero, zero represents, is represented by the maximum amplitude, zero, one by the next biggest, one, one by the next biggest, and one, zero actually by an amplitude of zero. So in this case, we have four waveforms to choose from. So we have log base two of four, which is equal to two bits per symbol. So we would say two bits per symbol or two bits per waveform. So as our analog waveforms move through the analog channel, they tend to get corrupted with noise and interference. So the noise can be the thermal noise present in the electronics of the receiver. It could also be caused by interference from other communication signals that happen to be transmitted in the area. And this noise and interference will corrupt the received or the waveforms that are, are observed at the receiver. And so then the job of the receiver is to try and make its best guess as to what digital information is represented by these kind of corrupted, distorted waveforms. And so the operations of demodulation and detection are basic, basically refer to the receiver taking these noisy waveforms and doing its best to figure out what information was, was transmitted. And as you can imagine, these guesses aren't perfect. And so sometimes we make mistakes and we guess maybe that we're receiving a one when in fact we are receiving a zero. And the result is a bit error. Now, because these bit errors are caused by noise and interference, and we model noise and interference as random processes, we typically model the errors that occur in the bitstream as a result of noise and interference as random as well. And typically we will assign, uh, we will represent this error process as a certain probability of bit error. And so I'll use a few different types of notation in this class. I might specifically write out p bit error. Um, sometimes I'll represent the probability of bit error just by p sub e. Sometimes I'll use little p. And I'll, I'll be clear when I'm using this notation what, what exactly I mean. And so what affects this probability of error? Well, the probability of error increases when we have lower signal power. So when we reduce our signal power, that means our signals are weaker at the receiver and more likely to get swamped out by the noise and interference. By the same token, if the noise and interference increase in, in power, they're more likely to swamp out the received signal. And also interestingly, the number of waveforms that we choose to transmit affects our probability of error. So for example, if we have a binary PAM system where we have two pulses that are you know, separated by a fair bit in their amplitudes, if we have you know, some noise riding on top of this symbol and a noise riding on top of this symbol, you know, we can still sort of draw a threshold between the two levels and fairly accurately guess whether we've been transmitting a one or a zero. If we then go to a four airy modulation system where perhaps, you know, we're using four levels now, or maybe this last one could be zero, probably makes more sense. 
when we have noise riding on top of these waveforms, because we have more amplitudes and the amplitudes are closer together, you know, when we draw our thresholds, the noise will sometimes sort of cross over the thresholds and it increases our probability of error. So the, the more symbols we use, the more crowded, if you like, our modulation space is, and the more likely we are to um, experience error. Aha, uh -huh, you might say, well, why not just, you know, transmit more amplitudes, but just space them further apart? Every time we transmit a higher amplitude, we're using a greater amount of voltage, which requires more power, which reduces our battery life, for example, if we're thinking about a wireless application. And so choosing the number of waveforms in our modulation set is actually kind of tricky. And we sort of trade off, you know, this robustness to error. So if we have only a few waveforms, we're relatively robust to error, but we also trade off how much information we can send through the channel. So the more waveforms we have, the more bits we send per waveform and the higher our throughput, which is something that we want to um, increase as well. So there's this reliability, transmit power, throughput trade-off that's really one of the classical trade-offs in digital communications. And if you choose to study that area, you'll dive into that in a, in a lot more depth. So another very, so I guess on the, on the previous slide when we were talking about modulation and noise and interference, we introduced one parameter, which was the probability of error, the probability of bit error. And if you think back to our very first module, that probability of error was one of our important quality of service or QoS metrics. Different traffic levels in our network can tolerate varying amounts of error. And so we need to be aware of how much error we have in our system and think about ways to mitigate that. The next really important parameter in our network design is throughput or basically bandwidth, like how fast can we shovel bits out to the user? And this is fundamental in network design. We all know as consumers, we, we buy new Wi-Fi access points so we can have better Wi-Fi speed in our house. We upgrade our internet connections so that we can watch Netflix at a higher resolution. And all of this is related to throughput and bandwidth. And so understanding, so throughput is a parameter that we're gonna be talking about for this entire lecture series. And it starts at the physical layer at a very fundamental level. So when we map our um, bits to analog waveforms for transmission, these analog waveforms will occupy a certain amount of space in the frequency domain. And we refer to this as our signal bandwidth or B sub S. And as we decrease our symbol duration, we increase our bandwidth, or basically bandwidth is proportional to one over our symbol time. And why is this? Well, basically, the faster you change a waveform, the more space it occupies in the frequency domain. And so if we're keeping our symbols or our waveforms constant for a very long time and only switching them occasionally, we're going to consume a small amount of bandwidth. And that's what I've, I've tried to show here. So we've got our, our sinusoid and it's you know at a at a constant phase and then we then we switch it up it's going to occupy a small amount of bandwidth so this waveform goes with this picture and technically speaking for those of you who do have a background in digital communications this frequency domain diagram isn't quite right the bandwidth could be approximately right but um this signal should be centered at some carrier frequency FC where the carrier frequency is the frequency of oscillation of the sinusoid. That's a bit of a detail, but just for those of you out there who, who want that. Um, then in the bottom part of this slide, we have another modulation scheme where our symbol duration is much shorter. So in this top diagram, basically, this is our symbol duration. And in this bottom diagram, this is our symbol duration. 
And so our symbol duration is a lot shorter. We're changing our waveform a lot more quickly. And as a result, it occupies more bandwidth in the frequency domain. So why does this notion of signal bandwidth matter? Well, it matters because in basically all cases, the analog channel that we're sending our waveforms through will limit the maximum bandwidth we can use for our signal. And there are a couple of different mechanisms for this. When we are using a wired channel, so for example, an ethernet cable, a coaxial cable, cable, even a fiber optic cable, all of these cables have a low pass characteristic. And so that means we can only send a certain amount of signal bandwidth through the channel before the channel will start to attenuate the higher frequency components and we basically experience signal distortion. The wireless channel, conversely, is a situation where typically our bandwidth is limited not because of the physical limitations of the, of the channel, but because of government regulations. So the wireless spectrum is very, very valuable. It is regulated typically by the government of the country that you happen to be in. And those governments will, auction, will have divided up the radio spectrum and will auction off little pieces of it for use by various companies. And when you are given permission to use a piece of spectrum, you are given very strict frequency limits, often maximum transmit power limits as well. And you're not allowed to go outside of those because wireless spectrum is so valuable. And so in basically all cases, the physical layer designer is dealing with a, a situation where the physical channel, like the amount of spectrum that we have to send our signal through is limited. And that means the physical characteristics, or if you like the government regulations of the wireless channel, will determine TS. And that's because the bandwidth of our signal, again, is proportional to one over the symbol time. So our channel basically determines our symbol rate and then our choice of modulation scheme determines how many bits we transmit per symbol or per waveform. And again, there's a, a trade-off there between reliability and throughput. You know, we, we get higher bit rates if we send more bits per symbol, but our probability of error tends to go up as well if we keep our transmit power constant. And so when we talk about throughput, the throughput of our physical layer is basically how many bits per second we can send through our physical layer channel. And throughput, which we represent as R, is equal to the number of bits per symbol divided by the symbol time. And so again, if we can make symbol time smaller, we will increase our throughput, but of course that means we occupy more space in the channel and that might be limited. And if we can increase the number of bits we transmit per symbol, that will also increase our throughput, but it can potentially affect our reliability. So that's kind of all I really, all the detail I really want to get into regarding the physical layer. As I said, it's a whole field and you can study whole classes on it if, if you want. To get us to, you know, starting to move up the protocol stack layer as quickly as possible, I'm going to leave it there. And we're basically now, based on kind of the fundamentals we discussed, going to assume a particular model for the physical layer. And we're basically going to assume that the physical layer provides us with essentially a bit pipe. And that's what I've tried to draw here. So we, we have a pipe where we basically shovel bits into it and bits come out the other end, right? The bits travel through the pipe at a certain rate, and that rate is determined by signal bandwidth, modulation, bits per symbol, all that kind of stuff. But from the perspective of the higher layers of the protocol stack, we're going to assume that that bit rate is fixed for the purposes of our lecture discussion. As it turns out, this, in many modern communication systems, particularly wireless systems now, this bit rate can actually change because wireless systems will use what's known as adaptive modulation, where they will actually dynamically change the number of 
waveforms they have in their modulation scheme based on channel conditions. But for the purposes of the, these lectures, we're going to assume that R is fixed. We are also going to assume that we have a certain fixed probability of error, and that's the probability a bit gets flipped when it travels through our bit pipe. So even in this simple example, you can see that the second bit in our waveform was one, or our, our bit sequence was one, and when it comes out the other end, it's zero. And that's because we experienced a bit error and it was just flipped around. Again, we're gonna assume a constant probability of error, but probability of error typically is not constant in a communications system, particularly a wireless system where transmit powers can vary, noise and interference powers can vary, and um, the resulting probability of error can vary as well. But this is essentially what we're going to assume for the, the physical layer system. And basically what we're gonna do for the rest of the bulk of this course is basically take these bit pipes that are able to shovel information at a particular rate but are subject to error we're going to take these bit pipes and we're going to use them to assemble the internet which is kind of a it's a cool discussion it's really neat for me to teach the class in this way because i find it very exciting to go from this very basic fundamental model to something that basically fa facilitates global network communication so i i think you know, it, it's fine for us to define a physical layer model as a bit pipe and to um, say that it is a certain data rate and a certain probability of error. But I think it's important, particularly at an undergraduate level, to give you an idea of what some typical data rates and some typical probability of error values are. Because I think one of the um, sort of pitfalls we sometimes fall into, particularly as university professors, is we throw a lot of variables at you, which are a very powerful mathematical tool. But if we don't tell you what those variables represent and give you at least some sort of orders of magnitude ideas of what kind of numbers we're talking about, then um, we're doing you a bit of a disservice. And so let's start with throughput. Now, throughput numbers are something that probably most of you are familiar with simply because I'm sure you've bought computer home networking products before and data rate is very much a part of the marketing of computer products. So we'll put the, the data rates on, you know, Wi-Fi access point boxes and when we talk about you know, home internet service and stuff like that. So these numbers will be, be kind of familiar to you. So, um, for example, you know, a Wi-Fi, a Wi-Fi router, these days, if you're using 802.11 AC, can give you, you know, up to one gigabits per second. Um, in most homes, probably you're, you're getting less than that, depending on on where you are in the home, probably several hundreds of megabits. If you've got, you know, a wired ethernet product, you're probably, um, well, in my in my home anyways, I, I've got mainly gigabit ethernet. So that's, that's all my wired ethernet connections. You can now buy up to 10 gigabits per second. Um, you'll see maybe 40 gigabits, 100 gigabits installed in sort of office buildings to connect maybe office buildings together or buildings on campus on university campuses together so we're talking kind of single gigabits or tens of gigabits with ethernet and these numbers kind of give the impression that you know we're going faster 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 you know if, you, if it's not a gigabit per second we're not interested but there's also a lot of interesting networking technology out there that is got very low data rates. So for example, one standard you might not have heard of is LoRa. LoRa is short for long range, and it's a very low data rate wireless standard meant to have very, very long range. So, um, you know, 15 kilometers, 20 kilometers, stuff like that. And it's mainly meant for internet of things type instrumentation applications. So smart meters in the home, connecting burglar alarms, monitoring oil and gas installations in the field and stuff like that. So um, particularly with the 
advent of the Internet of Things and connecting all kinds of devices to the Internet, we're not only seeing, you know, just faster, faster all the time, but we're seeing a really interesting and very significantly growing niche um, for lower data rate products that are focused maybe on longer range if they're wireless and certainly um, low cost and certainly low energy consumption. Now, probability of error numbers need a little bit more introduction because this is something that probably you're not super familiar with. And um, as we've seen, probability of error depends on the modulation scheme that you choose, the more bits per waveform or the more bits per symbol that you send, generally the higher your probability of error. If you lower your transmitted signal power, probability of error goes up. If the power of the noise and interference in your system increases, your probability of error goes up. And the other thing that can affect probability of error is the use of error correction codes. And error correction codes essentially add extra information to your packet and the receiver can use that information to correct bit errors that might occur in the transmitted information stream. And a very simple example of an error correction scheme is a repetition code where, you know, if you're in a noisy environment, like a noisy cafe, if you just repeat yourself, you know, if you're not sure that the person has heard you, then that um, is an example of a, of a simple error correction scheme. And so what are some typical values for probability of error? Well, they're actually surprisingly low. Um, so a wireless link, for example, might have a, a raw probability of error. And when we talk about raw, we usually mean without error correction codes. A raw probability of error of 1 times 10 to the minus 3. Um, with error correction codes, we might get it down to 10 to the minus 6. So only one error every million bits transmitted. Uh, fiber optic link can do even better. So fiber optic links um, have incredibly low raw um, probability of error values, 10 to the minus 12. And this is kind of typical of a lot of wired communication systems. The, the physical layer in Ethernet, for example, typically has a very low probability of error as well. And you might look at that and you might say, well, wow, that's amazing. Like if I only made one mistake in every million exam questions written, you know, I would be like an amazing student and I'd be getting all kinds of awards and big scholarships and stuff. And so these numbers seem so small that it seems like we can just kind of forget about them. But it's important to kind of put this into context. Even though we don't have very many errors per, you know, numbers of bits transmitted, we are transmitting a huge number of bits. So just for context, let's say we've got an 80 megabit per second Wi-Fi link, so relatively low speed Wi-Fi compared to um, a lot of the, the Wi-Fi systems today. If we had a probability of error of 10 to the minus 6, which is kind of as low as we can expect on a wireless link with error correction codes, then we're going to get 4,800 bit errors every minute. And that's quite a few, particularly if we're trying to download an app, for example, that can't really tolerate any errors at all. On a fiber optic link, let's say we've got a 10 gigabit per second fiber optic link, which is sort of a typical fiber optic rate for like one of the big backhaul links that connect maybe two office buildings together. A probability of error of 10 to the minus 12 means that we get only 36 bit errors every hour. And that's a lot better, right? That's a, that's a lot more like it. And because of that, fiber optic cables or fiber optic systems tend not to use error correction codes. And it's a good thing because it's hard to use error correction codes when you want to go really, really, really fast. So sort of the, the design um, strategy that fiber optic designers will take is make a really, really clean, really, really good physical layer that can go super fast and not use error correction codes. But in the wireless domain, we don't really have a clean physical layer as an option. And so error correction codes are more commonly used. So one additional bit of detail I guess about um, bit errors is that I will sometimes in my lectures represent bit errors or I, I will refer to error patterns and 
You know, as we send a sequence of bits through this physical layer bit pipe, some of the bits will get flipped due to errors caused by noise and interference. And that creates a pattern in the, or if we think of the, the positions where we had bits flipped, that in turn defines a pattern. And so um, here's an example where we've got a transmit, a transmitted frame, a five bit frame, and it goes through the channel and the first and last bits in that frame get flipped due to errors. I will sometimes refer to the error pattern in that frame and we represent the error pattern also by a sequence of bits where the positions where an error occurs are represented by ones and the positions where the bits came through without error we represent using zeros. And the received frame is then the exclusive OR of the transmit frame with the error pattern. And so zero exclusive OR with one flips it to a one, one exclusive word with one flips it to a zero, and then the other three bits go through intact. And so there will be some theory that we work on in this course where I will be talking about error patterns, particularly error detection. So we're gonna be talking a lot about detecting errors and different communicate or different error detection schemes can detect some error patterns, but not others. So just be aware when I talk about an error pattern, we're basically representing it as a we're representing these error patterns as a bit sequence, sequence where the error locations are represented with ones and everything else is represented using a zero. And one last concept I'd like to touch on is the notion of simplex and duplex transmission. And it basically refers to the directionality of our physical layer communications link. Simplex communication shown at the top here is unidirectional. That means node one can transmit to node two, but node two can't transmit back to node one. And you might say, well, that's kind of a, a weird communication system because what's the point of talking if you also can't listen? Uh, but th these would be things like very simple electronics that you might find around your home. So for example, I have an electronic thermometer where I put the temperature sensor outside and it transmits temperature information to a little display that I have in my kitchen, that's simplex communication. That thermometer sends information to my kitchen display, but there's no way to send, and no need to send information back to the thermometer. So simplex communication tends to be sort of this very simple kind of instrumentation, smart home type stuff. Um, a, uh, a burglar alarm is another example where you might have sensors around your home to detect if somebody opens your window or moves in your house when you're away. Those sensors send information to a central point. They typically don't also receive information back because there's no need. Half duplex refers to bidirectional communication that is supported by taking turns. So half duplex can um, so node one can transmit to node two, node two can transmit to node one, but that can't occur at the same time. And so um, verbal channels, for example, are typically, we treat them as half duplex. So when I'm talking, you're listening, and then when I stop talking, you talk. Of course, you know, if you're watching like a political debate, sometimes two people will try to talk over top of each other at the same time, but we know it doesn't work. Um, another example is old uh, or old CB radios or, or those family band radios that people sometimes use where you, you click the button to talk and while you're talking you can't listen and then you release the button and then you're able to hear the other person. As it turns out, Wi-Fi is also half duplex. So you either transmit, receive, but not both. Um, it, it seems like Wi-Fi should be you know, completely bidirectional because, for example, we can have, you know, Zoom calls or, or FaceTime calls over Wi-Fi, but it's just because it's switching back and forth so quickly that it seems fully bidirectional. And finally, full duplex is a physical layer that can simultaneously support
communications in both directions. And this is typically only possible when you have two parallel but separate physical communications channels, one for supporting communication in one direction and the other one for supporting communication in the other direction. So for example, cellular telephones do this sometimes by having one band of frequencies for base station to mobile transmission and another band of frequencies for mobile to base station transmission.